Sunday school, you guys are dismissed. Except for high schoolers, stay here. I'll try to keep the message fairly short today, so we'll be back together for lunch soon. But thank you so much to all of our volunteers who lead Sunday school. Have a good time. All right. I feel like there's hardly a need for me to get up here and talk after our amazing testimonies and beautiful music. I feel like my spirit's already uplifted. But I have a message, and it's in the schedule for me to give it, so I'm going to talk. Uh, as I mentioned before, it's springtime, and I just can't help myself. When it's spring, I see God everywhere. And I see God's beauty, and I see God's love, and I see a lot of lessons that we can take for our life on how to grow and how to learn from the creation that God made for us. So um, my topic today is the question, do you need spiritual resurrection? And I'm going to introduce this by kind of a metaphor. I, this winter, I purchased a lot of tulips. I was really excited to purchase bulbs because we have a new place. And, you know, bulbs, you can just put them in the ground in the fall and forget about them. And then the next spring, you've got these beautiful flowers that just burst out of the winter. And uh, I, I got this special deal through a guy on Facebook like wholesale flowers and at the you know at the end of all of his he sells all sorts of things and then at the end he kind of just combines the leftovers and, and is like hey anybody wants this really cheap I'll ship it to you free and, and so I was like me, me, me. and I ordered like 450 tulip bulbs shipped to me for $75 it's like a steal and then uh, it actually got lost in the mail and it never arrived and uh, you know, it was like, it was already kind of late to plant them, but uh, finally we went through the claim with UPS and everything, and then got refunded, and he was like, well, do you, do you want the refund, or do you want me to try to send you some more bulbs? I was like, if you've got bulbs, I'll take them. So he, he shipped me this box, it finally arrived. It's February, which is really quite too late to plant bulbs, but I did it anyway. I just, I, I just like dug a trench and dumped them all in and covered them with dirt. <laughs> and, and amazingly, they, even though they only had six weeks or so in the ground, they, before I knew it, they were sprouting and blooming. And I think he sent me like a thousand to, to make up for them being late and being lost and everything. So I've just got this mass of beautiful tulips. And to get my money's worth out of them, I, uh, my most joy is to make arrangements and to give them away. So I've been, as soon as they just start to open, I cut them and I put them in a bag in my refrigerator and, and Mike is frustrated because there's no space for eggs or milk or <laughs> anything in our refrigerator. I've got masses of blooms in the bottom of our refrigerator. Um, but the amazing thing about tulips is you can pick them and you can put them in your refrigerator and they can be there for two to three weeks. And then you take them out and they, my first thought was, oh, I, I overdid it. Like, they're floppy. The petals are, are limp. <laughs> and I'm like, oh, there's no way this tulip is coming back from this. But, um, but you give them a fresh cut you put them in water and maybe some support because they're like completely droopy. I, I, I tie some string around them so they're all wrapped in upwards. And then in a couple hours, I can take off the string and they're all standing up straight and they're opening up and they're beautiful. And it just is mind boggling to me that a flower can go from looking mostly dead to, to looking like it was just picked from your garden. And I feel like sometimes that's us, too. Do you ever feel like that maybe you're in a dark, cold place? 
in the bottom of a refrigerator. Sometimes we end up there spiritually. And we might feel like it's hard to stand up straight or feel like we've got a backbone or we've got something to stand on. And when we're in that place, it's hard to imagine anything might be different or could be better. But just as our tulips can be resurrected, I think there's always hope for our spiritual resurrection too. When I was on STF, which is our, like our gap year program, now it's called GPA, I, I was training to be a captain. I was trying to be, training to be a group leader. And um, the thing I was most stressed out about was how to be a good leader and how to give good guidance and how to take care of my members. But actually, the people who were training us said, the most important thing is safety. <laughs> We're driving these 15 passenger vans all around the country and they, and they said, you know, you can always resurrect somebody spiritually. You can't resurrect them physically. So, so don't get in an accident. You know, the, so safety was most important. But, it, but I do feel like it was a good reminder that no matter how dead we might feel inside sometimes, or we're in a gold, cold, dark refrigerator spiritually, we can always be resurrected spiritually. I think that to really believe that though, especially when it's hard, it's important for us, it's important for me to remember you know, where I came from and who created me. Our original design, right? God created us to mature, to grow, and to resemble God. That is like our DNA. That is our blueprint as children of God. That is the only thing that we were created to do. That is, you know, without fallen nature, without like the difficulties that we unnecessarily have to face in this world, that is just where we would go. The only thing that we would need, you know, if, if there were no fall in an ideal world, we would just need to make sure we're in the right environment, right? We're in the warm sunshine and good dirt, and we need to be getting sunlight and water. We need to be getting the proper nutrients and in the right environment. So unfortunately, that's, it's not just that simple for us. We do need to take into account the fact that we have inherited some fallen nature. We do make mistakes. Um, there is restoration that needs to happen in this world and in our lives. Unfortunately, this world is not the world of God's ideal. And none of us could say that we've ever really fully experienced what life really should be like. What is the fullness of love? What is the fullness of God? I think we get glimpses of it, right? When we hold a newborn baby, when we fall in love and we marry the person God intends us to marry, when we work, we invest ourselves into a project and it comes to fruition, we get these glimpses of what the ideal world is like. Actually, just this past weekend, um, we, Thursday, we went up to Wyoming and we visited George and Maria Love, one of our church family members living up there. And it happened to be the one night of the year that um, Mozart's Requiem was, play, was being performed at the university there. And I had never heard it, um, but we got front row seats. It's a, it's a relatively small stadium anyway, but we were like, we were like six feet away from the opera singer. Oh my gosh, if you've never been six feet away from an opera singer, it's a really intense experience. <laughs> I was like, oh, this is what they mean when like a voice could shatter glass. Like it's so loud. But I, I also feel like we can get glimpses. I feel like these geniuses like Mozart and, and Handel, like they, they tapped into something that gives a view into what human potential is. 
there's such an incredible beauty and the harmony and all the different parts coming together. And I feel like this isn't a human, this isn't a human invention. This is like God's finding a way through people to show what true harmony is and what true beauty is. So we can, we can catch glimpses. But, but as our daily reality, you know, not so much. So how can we work towards resurrecting our spirit? Or how can we work towards something we don't even necessarily know what is it supposed to be? We always have to go to the source. So this is a quote from the Bible. John 1.1. 1, 1. In the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. So I, I think what I get from this is the meaning and the, the, this is the ideal and the purpose that God had for creation was like what God started with. God spoke the Word, God spoke their universe into creation. And then, and then it's also encapsulated in the words that God gives us. Now, we don't necessarily have written words that God wrote with his hand, right? We have to find God's words through people that God dwelled in and spoke through, like Jesus and our true parents. So I think the first part of our resurrection, of our spiritual resurrection, is to get the proper nutrients. Right? To where, where were we originally designed to get our spiritual growth from? Creation. And we also have God's words through, we could read Hunduke, we can read the Bible. But our immers immersing ourselves in God's word is it's like a practice that shows us the way because we don't know what this world really should look like. We can catch glimpses, we can imagine, but for us to really know, we have to go to the person who envisioned it and set it in motion in the beginning, right? So we really need to go to the source. Whether it's coming to church on Sunday and listening to a message, or reading God's words through the Bible or Hundake, or maybe it's attending a workshop when we get an opportunity, going to Blue Dragon Pil Pilgrimage for our younger ones, you know, going to summer camps. These are ways that we can immerse ourselves in not just this world, but really like a, a vision of what God intends it for us to be. These are like the nutrients we need to grow well. And then the second part of resurrection is for tulips coming out of a dark refrigerator and into the warm sunlight. The tulips naturally grow towards the light. So we, but we also need an environment to resurrect our spirits. We need to be in community around people who have the same goals and values people who can understand our heart and support us. Part of, our, of improving our environment might also be removing things that are not helpful. Maybe removing some influences that are not supporting our journey toward the ideal, right? Whether it's removing distractions, our devices sometimes, um, Maybe we spend too much time watching the news. Maybe it's some habits that we have. Um, some ideas that I, you know, today after church we have the strings of the heart meeting and I know we have some new ladies joining us. Men are also welcome. But it's, it's just this example of things that we can do to put ourselves in an environment with other people who can you know, give us love and support and work towards something positive, contribute towards something good. It's whether it's attending ladies' nights or guys' nights or inviting somebody to dinner over to your house and having good uh, give and take, having good conversation. I 
I found that personally, when I am in a funk or kind of feel stuck or limp, <laughs> uh, as many times it's because I'm surrounded by thoughts of things that I should be doing and I'm not doing, or feelings of guilt or shame. And yet I find time after time that dwelling on those three things has never ever once motivated me to make a positive change. <laughs> so sometimes we think that uh, that will make a difference. But a relationship with a living God is really not like that. I think sometimes we, uh, Christianity in general, until more recently has really been focused on God saying, do what I say or you will be punished, right? And we wanna avoid punishment. But I think the living God is really more concerned about a relationship of love with us, and it's more about removing the things in our way to touching that love. Here's a, a quote from our true father, Reverend Moon. Until now, we have called upon God based only on a concept. We have referred to God as our subject partner, only in a religious sense, like master. Yet God is the subject partner of our very existence, right? It's not a master-servant relationship. Our, our entire being, our entire life, our very existence is in relationship with God. Furthermore, he is the subject partner of our daily life and the subject partner of our philosophy of life. We don't always live like this, but doesn't mean it's not true. However, no matter how deep and wide our philosophy and view of him as our subject partner may be, if we cannot explain and experience God in daily life, emotionally and practically, what good is it? If there are people whose philosophy of life enables them to experience the value of God as their subject partner in daily life, and to be so united with God that they would not exchange him for the world, they must be the people for whom God is seeking. So this quote is a little bit structural. It talks about God as like the subject partner a lot, but I think that what it's really conveying is that God is our source. And God didn't just put this world into motion and say, all right, good luck. God wants to be in every part of our life on a very deep and relationship, skin touch level. So I, I'm, I'm taking more of the philosophy of that if we remove the obstacles to God, we will be surprised by how God will work in our life because that is how we were designed. The very fabric of our being, our DNA, our blueprint is, is structured so that we are meant to live with God. I think of it like a garden growing in nature, right? For a garden to grow well, many times you don't actually have to do too much to the garden. The seeds know what to do. The bulbs know which way to grow. The environment, the, the, the water and the light and the soil is pretty much all they need. What, what we need to do as a gardener is to remove the hard rocks, right? to uh, take out the weeds, the things that get in the way, the things that want to choke out the tender roots of the plants. And then the garden in its own way will grow in beauty just the way God designed it. So I think our life is similar. In our school, we also have a, a kind of a little saying that says, slow is smooth and smooth is fast. This, in an academic sense, it's more saying like, if you, if you learn the basics, right, if you get the, the foundations really well, then you can, you can run with it, right? But, it, but, it, but it, I, I picture this, this road, right? If it's a bumpy road, if there's rocks in the road, if there's obstacles in the road, you, you can try really, really hard to 
be a good person, try really, really hard to talk to God, but, when we've, but if you've got a huge rock in the way, if you run really fast, you're just gonna run into the rock or trip over it, right? We have to remove the obstacles, whether that's addictions, whether it's bad habits, whether it's actually removing some distractions from our house or from our life. When those things are out of the way, we'll find actually running on the road isn't so hard after all. So I think sometimes we think of developing a relationship with God as being really hard or it's hard work. And in some ways it is hard to get rid of the things of ourselves that are difficult, our fallen natures, right? To take the step we know we need to take to take something toxic out of our life. But I think it's also helpful to remember that it's actually in our DNA to live with God. And if we remove the obstacles, we might be surprised at how we see God working in our life and how much beauty there is to be found in this life. So I'm going to finish up with an excerpt of one of our True Father's prayers. Maybe this will be my prayer. But I, um, I really love this prayer. I feel like it almost encapsulates anything we need in our spiritual life because it really gets to the core of our relationship with God. We earnestly hope and desire that you, so your father's talking to God, will not let us become people who know heaven by receiving the word. Rather, please let us become people who know heaven through our hearts. Please guide us to not become people who seek to be saved through the word, but rather people who are saved in the presence of our Father through our hearts and can sing songs of life. Then we earnestly hope and desire, Father, that you will allow us to become people who are able to first see how much you have worked and suffered and who are able to bow down our heads and comfort you. If we have a goal in life, please let us pursue that goal of life through our hearts. And if we must have content in our daily life, we earnestly hope and desire, Father, that you will let the content of our daily lives be your heart alone. Since many people have come before you, Father, please let them find on their own for whom they are staying here, for what they are working, and to what place they are heading. If there were a person who could be recognized by your saying, you are a person who will stay with my heart forever, we know that there could be no one happier than that person. That's my message for today. Thank you so much.